Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in person, as well as those who are joining us online for um, is actually our first GIS RAL seminar in quite a few years. So we're super excited to have um, Dan Basut from Esri here to, uh, to talk about transforming data access for visualization, analysis, and communication. So Dan leads the development of the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World Environment content, uh, which includes information about the Earth's land, ocean, atmosphere, and ecosystems. Prior to Esri, Dan worked at NOAA for two decades, leading data visualization efforts for research, communication, and education. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jen, and thank you for everybody that's uh, here, and hopefully I can virtually wave to everybody but not see you wave back. That's always uh, gratifying. So as uh, Jen mentioned, I'm, I wanted to talk about ways in which we're trying to improve the ways that people access data and information, and I think those are two very different things, you know, data being kind of more raw data, data that we use and, and analyze, and then information is the uh, derivative products that come from that analysis or that, that subsetting of larger data sets. Um, and I think it's really actually great to be able to, to ha give this presentation at NCAR, um, who themselves and you know UCAR have transformed the ways that you know, that weather and climate information and atmospheric information have been distributed and accessed for so long. Um, you know my background is um, before Esri, I was at NOAA for a long time, as, as Jen mentioned, and Threads data system, Threads data server was like my be very best friend. Used it every day, power user. Um, and really understood the, you know, the, the power of how streaming data can really improve our workflows and the simplicities of our workflows, We're trying to simplify it. Um, but I basically came up you know, with uh, some of my journey. Uh, my background is in marine science and, and um, coastal environmental um, analysis. Um, and uh, I moved along uh, from uh, throughout the southeast um, doing my academic training, eventually moving over to NOAA, becoming more uh, versed in satellite and modeling, or satellite imagery and analysis and remote sensing and modeling. Um, and that's uh, taken me over to, to Esri, where um, you know, I lead a lot of efforts in developing open data um, access. But then um, the other thing that I'm leading across Esri is supporting climate resilience information systems across the United States with the federal agencies in support of um, the executive orders that came out of the, the very first days of the Biden-Harris administration. Um, it's been really, really great to be able to, to try to move the ball forward on that. And we'll, we'll uh, cover some aspects of that today. But what I'm really here to talk to you about are these, these uh, couple elements of open data, um, data visualization, spatial analysis and communication, and how technology can help improve these processes. Um, and these are some of the things that I focus on every day. Um, I like to start trying to explain what I do with an analogy, and that is we all remember, yes, going to Blockbuster. I, I think mo most of us have, some people are probably a little too young for Blockbuster, but I, I think I still found one of my Blockbuster cards uh, relatively recently. Uh, but, you, you know, you, you used to, you know, when you wanted a movie, you would go to Blockbuster or whatever your video store was. You, you know, go find it. Maybe it was there. Maybe it wasn't. Um, okay, you, you have it, you brought that DVD or that VHS back. If it was that DVD, you know, maybe you put it in and you're like, oh, wow, it doesn't even work, right? Now I have to travel back to the store, go exchange it, you know, do all these things. It was a very arduous process to find content that you could actually use and enjoy. You know, now we're on our phone, we're on our tablet, we're on the airplane, and we're just streaming that content into whatever client or device that we want to use. And it's the same thing with music or whatever it happens, art, right? Um, and that's what we're trying to do um, in my day job in Living Atlas is to improve access, get rid of the downloads and having to go to thousands of different sites, you know, over the course of your career to get the data that you need, that we can have a very simplified access um, stream that data in, download it when it's necessary, but for most uh, you know, processes, you probably don't even need to do that. Um, and then it allows people to be able to build value-added products and services on top of those core data services. And again, this is nothing new to 
to um, you at NCAR, um, but it's something that we're trying to get people more um, acclimated to who are in the GIS fields. Because this is a little bit different than just always going and downloading that shapefile. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides, and this really shows what we do as GIS practitioners, um, especially those of us who focus kind of in this weather and climate realm. Um, but it's really not about just that weather and climate data. It's really about what the impacts are and how we integrate that other types of information to find you know, those impacts or those solutions that are needed. Um, and so we have the environmental data here, but we need to be able to integrate it with that social and economic or infrastructure, whatever it happens to be, into a consistent platform so that we can analyze it and find those intersections, find those opportunities to make the world a better place. That's ultimately, you know, I think all of our jobs as, as, as scientists and data scientists is, you know, to support decisions to, to improve this planet. Um, and so the living atlas of the world is trying to do that. So ArcGIS uh, Online um, has a 50, 100, I forget, whatever, million data sets that are shared across of it um, from different users that are all using this platform. But then in Living Atlas, we're looking at a very small curated subset of that. It's about 10,000 different layers across all different uh, domains, whether it's um, uh, infrastructure, demographics, real-time satellite imagery that's coming in, weather and climate data, ecosystems, ocean data, whatever it happens to be, trying to find all of those different components that we need to be able to integrate together. So this is freely available through the ArcGIS system. And actually, most of these data layers are available writ large as open data services. Um, and we'll get to explore Living Atlas a little bit. Um, but you know, there's just a wealth of information that's available here that can really be used and integrated. And all of this stuff integrates seamlessly. I think that's, that's the really exciting thing. And so I want to show you some of the power of, of what, this can, what this is. So I'm in ArcGIS Pro right now, and I'm going to hit play. And I want to do an analysis of potential climate uh, uh, risk impact uh, for extreme temperatures. So let me try to hit play one more time. There we go. And so I'm going to go into Living Atlas, which you can access through ArcGIS Pro, and I'm going to pull in some downscaled uh, climate projections for the United States. So we're going to look at a late century RCP 4.5 scenario. And this is a multi-dimensional image service, meaning that this particular image service has uh, 47 different variables associated with it. So thresholded um, climate information. I'm going to then pull in the electric transmission grid for the United States. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to pull in some poverty data for the United States. So in just a couple seconds, I have accessed three different data sets, three different data structures, um, but they all ha have some value here. So after I've subsetted just a couple of the variables that I wanted from that, um, that climate model projection, I took uh, cooling degree days, um, which is an estimate of the energy needed to make your environment comfortable in a building. Um, and also, let me uh, pause this. Um, and then also um, uh, days over 90. So we can have an understanding of intensity and frequency of the demands on our, on our electrical grid system. And I've also subsetted this just to Texas, and I wonder why. So let me uh, roll back. Um, we can kind of see if I can control this. Maybe you can't. Uh, rewind. Anyway, all right, so we'll, we'll just have to watch that one again. So uh, I'll pull in this, this uh, climate threshold data. We can see that there's other climate threshold data that's available, both as image services and features. So uh, use what you will. This is actually the data that came from the fourth um, national climate assessment. Um, and the data for the fifth national climate assessment is going into uh, Living Atlas right now. So we're working with USGCRP on that. So again, just uh, dragging and dropping in my different data sets. And poverty. So ACS is um, annual census um, estimates for the United States for thousands of different demographic components. Um, 
so here we go. I've subsetted this area. I'm going to run this tool called sample, in which I can look at my climate projections. I can look at the transmission lines. And basically what I'm going to do is suck the pixel values of where, where that transmission line uh, intersects those rasters into the transmission line data. Um, and then what I can also do is run this tool. And it's going to give me a table that is, you know, every one of those segments of the transmissions, what is the cooling degree days and what is the days over 90 degrees in that table. I was able to process that as multidimensional. If I had 30 variables in, it would suck in 30 variables. So now what I can also do is go in there and just join those attributes back over from that table into the transmission um, system. And then lastly, I'm gonna do a spatial join. I wanna suck in the poverty data at the tract level, the neighborhood level, into, that, into those line segments. So I can do that with the spatial join. And then lastly, I'm gonna calculate a composite. So right now, we have apples and oranges and bananas, right? We have days over 90 degrees, we have cooling degree days, we have um, the percent of every neighborhood that falls below the poverty status. And I wanna build a single map that incorporates all of that into a single layer, right? There's a really cool tool that I use all the time, Create Composite Index. And what we're gonna be able to do is smash those three variables into a single layer that informs decisions. So I can say, here's my cooling degree days and my days over 90 degrees, and I'm gonna pick my um, poverty. I pulled in all of the poverty variables, but I'm just gonna pick percent of the population that is below the poverty status. Just making sure that that one is what I need. And then also, there was one other attribute that was in the transmission lines, and that is the voltage capacity of the line. So is there going to be a high demand, and can that, does that line have some adaptive capacity to be able to you know, meet that demand? I'm going to invert that because I, only, I want to look at areas with low uh, transmission voltage capacity. All right, and all of a sudden now I have a single map that shows both the mean uh, score of that index and then also the percentile for every um, one of those transmission segments. And so in this was done in real time, right? So in four minutes or less, we now have a decision ready map that shows the percentile of each one of those segments for meeting that different composite. And you could run that and reweight the individual components however you want. But just this analysis, being able to do this in a couple minutes without having to go and download things is again, transforming the way that we do this kind of work. So again, I'll, I'll show you Living Atlas in a minute, but we've been able to build this system because this is done in collaboration with partners um, just like NCAR, right? So we work very closely with um, uh, data providers around the world, whether those are national agencies, NGOs, academia groups, whatever it happens, or um, even our um, corporate business partners, Fortune 500 companies that might have things that would be useful. Um, so it's really, we're building this system as a, a very distributed network of services, but a centralized database by which you know how to access them. So Living Atlas is really just a database that reaches out to different locations of data that's been published by Esri, data that's been published by other groups um, and, and partners. So it's not just one group that, that maintains the responsibility, but then Esri does take on the, the, um, the ownership of curating that. And so we have subject matter experts that are, not, that are reviewing every nomination. And I would say about 50 to 75% of nominations get rejected from, you know, from Living Atlas. Um, just because the data quality wasn't there, the usability wasn't there. Who is this person? Um, you know, we want to make sure that this is as authoritative as possible. So I'm going to jump over to Living Atlas really quickly.
And you can find Living Atlas at livingatlas.arcjs.com, but it's, uh, again, available within all of the different software products that Esri builds. Um, and one thing that I'd like to, to highlight here is it's not just the data, but we also publish a lot about the workflows and how best to use this information through blogs and lessons and things like that. And we, we bring that into this one website. So the best way to find and search across these 10,000 different data sets is through this website here. I think you have a better user experience when you're doing that. But you can see we have everything from uh, 1,200 different base maps. Um, imagery, we have real time. Um, updates on all Sentinel satellites, um, Landsat, the full data collection of Landsat, NAEP, all these different remote sensing products, but then also deep learning modules that are, um, that can be used against these satellite um, products. So uh, tree point classification, segmentations, um, classifications, extracting different features from uh, remote sensing imagery, um, that that's available. Of course, we have you know boundaries, um, demographics, rich demographics, as you saw from uh, Census Bureau or international census agencies, um, and infrastructure, buildings, bridges, all those different things that you need to understand, and of course the environment, and all these things are broken down into different subcategories, so you can quickly peruse them. So we have a lot of real-time feeds from the National Weather Service that are going in here a lot of the climate data from uh, the U.S. agencies that are going in, um, uh, and then countless other resources that are found within Living Atlas. Um, I should also mention that there are some really cool applications that are built on top of these, and uh, we should probably also see some examples of those later uh, when I get into visualizations. But um, there's a variety of really um, useful, um, whether it's wildfire, that's an issue here in the Boulder region. It's not just the wildfire, it is um, who's impacted by the wildfire. This one application here, Wildfire Aware, it brings together, I think, 17, 23 different data sets from 17 different sources. So we could look, is there a wildfire over here? Well, we'll just go to the big one in California. So on the fly, we are summarizing, here is the boundary of that fire, one of the largest in California history. We can see here um, satellite uh, hotspot detections um, in the map. Um, we are summarizing you know, who's fighting this fire, what the status of it is. We're bringing in weather and air quality information from NOAA and EPA, census to understand who's living within this area, uh, population and demographics. Um, who speaks English and who has a car to get out? Some uh, parts that, that really changes, or we can do the same thing with hurricanes and you see um, in different areas uh, where those vulnerable populations are, or what's actually being burned there. What are the ecosystems or what are the critical species that might be threatened? And so this is what WebGIS is allowing us to do. And we're doing this in real time from this distributed network of services. I find this kind of cool. I could say that because I didn't build that. I have no uh, technical skills whatsoever. So I like to call this um, a new pattern of GIS, right? GIS is no longer uh, constrained to your desktop and what you have locally. It is really being able to pull in and in real time do these summarizations, do these integrations, look at, and, and not just do layering, Right. As we saw in uh, the transmission line example, you know, I, I think GIS used to be just doing the layers on top of each other and you would have an application and you just start building and building and building. But what is that synthesis, that information product that we can do that takes all that big data and makes it a single map that is ready for a decision maker to interpret? Um, and so that's that's what this new pattern is. But then I think where Living Atlas is advancing it is. Um, it's not just the individual data products that we have that are available. We have those synthesized maps that are available or those uh, derived products, those derived, um, uh, for example, uh, that local th uh, threshold of data. It's not the daily TMIN, TMAX, and precipitation data. It is this pre-thresholded information that's ready to go. So it took me a while to process that data 
But now you can start with that. You don't have to start at, you know, with those original NetCDF files. You start where I left off, which saves everybody a lot of time. So again, you know, the goal is big data to small, right? So uh, people always talk about the value of big data and there's a lot of value in it, but it's not inherently decision ready. And I think that's where we need to, as GIS practic practitioners, is move that space into those authoritative um, or um, reliable sources of these derived products that can support information. Um, and then also teach the template or the, the processes by which those were done so it can be repeated for maybe a different area of interest if it's only done for a certain locality. So that's one thing that we're doing right now um, with the US government, and this will all be going into Living Atlas as well, is we're building this climate resilience information system. And the idea is to look at the ways in which climate data is used, not from an academic pursuit, but on the ground, right? State, local governments need it now, and they have the funds to actually be able to do implementations and mitigations against their climate-related uh, hazards, right? But they still need that information in very easy to access formats. And so this climate resilience information system, which will be uh, launched later this uh, fall, is trying to do that, but give states and counties and developers the flexibility also not to be constrained with, I just need this one particular, all I get is this one particular ensemble that may not be optimized for their particular area of the country. Right. California has completely different um, model weightings than, you know, the rest of the, the than uh, what Massachusetts has. Um, and we want to be able to support that and allow them to develop services and applications on top of this. Um, and they don't have to republish the same data. So we're looking at the we're working with data from the National Climate Assessment all the different downscale products that have come in through that process from LOCA2, uh, STAR, which is Catherine Hayhoe's um, downscale product, um, some of the, the blends, the multi-model blended ensembles of those two different uh, uh, data sets, and then some of the historical observed climatologies that went into some of the downscaling. But these are available in services, uh, both as feature services for pr particular geographies with different SSPs and time steps, but then um, raster services that can support more um, customized analysis. If you don't care about your Huck 8 or your uh, tribal geography or a county and you want something else, you can easily uh, um, access it just like I ran that analysis off of those other locus services and come up with your own custom geography summarization. Um, and then have all of the original data that's sitting in AWS as open data services. So you can map directly to that S3 bucket and you don't have to worry about the egress um, on that system. Um, so we're really excited about um, what this will allow uh, people to do. Um, so, I mean, you can look around and you, uh, there's already been state climate portals from uh, Washington, Massachusetts, California, uh, I believe Florida has one, all these different groups. USGS has their own climate application portal. Uh, FEMA has their own, um, NOAA is developing them, all these things. Our goal is to reduce the duplication of that and everybody can hopefully be able to tap into subset or filter these different services and develop the applications on top of it. And then we'll also be developing templates notebooks and documentation and support. So it's not just the data, it's all the legs of the stool that you need to be able to um, access to, to effectively build out your climate services. Um, this, is, this pattern of sharing data um, and sharing it in a consistent way is also improving the ways in which we collaborate. This was actually really cool. Um, when the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore was struck, um, that happened, I mean, I, I live on the West Coast, and so it was very early in the morning, and I had some emails from NOAA, and we were able to set up a collaboration group between NOAA, um, U.S. Coast Guard, and Army Corps, in which they were able to share all of their information that they were collecting in real time through ArcGIS. It wasn't part of Living Atlas, but it was still part of that new, newer pattern. And that instantly they were able to share, but behind security, 
all of that information that was critical to that initial response in which they were trying to still save lives. Um, but then all the um, data that they were collecting, bathymetric mapping, um, uh, damage assessments was all still going in and shared across those agencies. Um, it was just incredible. One thing within the climate space that we've been looking at is, is I've been leading development of this climate mapping for resilience and adaptation portal or camera. This is at uh, resilience.climate.gov. Um, this was intended to support the rollout of the bipartisan infrastructure law funds. Um, and so they re the White House realized that we're gonna open up the floodgates of funding with billions of dollars to support climate resilience and hazard mitigation, but people really don't know how to access or understand what their actual hazard and risk profiles are now and in the future. So if they're gonna build and build back better, build more resilient uh, the communities, they need to have that be data informed. And so within about a month and a half, we were able to build this system because all of the data that was needed was already federated and in Living Atlas, and we could just pull this data and build it into a hub, build it into these applications um, in a relatively short order and still have it be reviewed by all of the agencies of the federal government. And so CAMERA includes data from NOAA and FEMA and USGS and Census and USDA. I think there's 13 to 15 different agencies that are feeding in their data into this system um, that allows us to do these um, applications where you can look at exposure, but not just exposure to climate variables into the future, but also understand the populations that are at risk that you're getting from census data and CGEST um, data, um, or understand the building codes that are, in, that are in that particular area. If you're building back, you shouldn't be building to the code requirements of the 1970s, which still exist in a lot of our communities. If that's the, the bare minimum requirement, you should be looking to exceed those requirements, right? Um, so we wanna make sure that people are informed of what those, those bare minimums for their particular area are as they're starting to think about more resilient communities. But then we can pull all that information into very simplified reports or provide full access to those web services. So it's enough to say, this is my exposure but then how do I do a vulnerability or risk assessment? Just like that transmission grid example, all those components are there in that one place so they can start to extend um, the mapping um, capabilities that are available. Uh, visualization. This is a new capability in, in ArcGIS Pro and it's a flood simulation modeler. Um, and this is based on high resolution uh, 3D elevation data that we have in Living Atlas. Um, if you have better resolution uh, DEMs for your particular area, you can feed it in here. Um, but then you can um, put in attributes of the soil. So what is the drainage of that particular area? Is it uh, more impervious surfaces? What is the rain rate that's gonna go into that particular area? And then start to understand how the, um, that particular uh, area will be flooding. Then you can tack on some risk assessments. So what are those buildings? What are the attributes of those buildings? Are they really at risk or are they more um, resilient to those types of flooding events? This isn't necessarily meant to be the end all be all uh, flooding simulation, but it gets people started. And you can run this not in you know, a matter of hours to compile that, that simulation, but it runs in seconds. Right? And so you can get a very quick assessment of what buildings would be at most at risk, and then you can do follow-on assessments there. Um, ArcGIS Online, so we can look at different ways that we could style demographic information. So from just a simple tract level, neighborhood level, to uh, dot density maps that are looking at different proportions of races here, to pie charts, right? And so this is dynamic mapping that needs no coding. Um, you're just swapping the, the style of the mapping there. Um, and as you're doing that, you can also play with the thresholding of that. So we call this smart mapping, where you're getting instant feedback on what the display of that data is. Um, and, you know, are you putting in the right thresholds to understand this data correctly? So this is just all uh, part of ArcGIS Online and the, the web map viewer. 
But visualization, you know, other things that have been somewhat complex are, are now standard and available to you. So doing stream flow or uh, streamline flow uh, maps, whether it's for um, UV wind or currents or whatever it happens to be, that's just a style that you can apply with no additional coding that's necessary. You just have your UV data ready to go. You point, you know, your you have that as a service and the, the, the map will generate that. Um, really crazy, almost Photoshop-like effects that you see in the top right where we can change both the colors but also the transparency values or use one layer to obfuscate or enhance the data that's found in another layer. So we're using um, gridded population estimates to drive home the patterns that you see in precipitation data. Where does it really matter? Where are those areas that we should be most concerned with? So just a lot of different uh, more advanced capabilities within the visualization space. And then uh, we like to build apps, especially when there's a repeated workflows um, that people do with applications or data that might be really difficult to use in a desktop um, setting. So um, in the top left, we have a, a drought aware app that's getting a refresh in the next couple of weeks. And it's kind of a preview of what it's gonna do, but it's like that wildfire aware, it's integrating a variety of agricultural statistics within a drought area. Um, jobs that are related to agriculture and the impact that those have on the economy there. And it's going to summarize um, those statistics based on the intensity of the drought or if there's drought in that particular area or not. Uh, we have hydrologic uh, components in there, so understanding components of the watershed that are impacted in the drought. What are the status of reservoirs? What is the stream flow within that area? Incorporating the national water model summaries into um, the drought analysis that's going in there, looking at uh, stream flow anomalies, for example. Um, and also then looking at populations uh, that are affected within those areas. Are there, what are the number of households versus multi-unit Right? There's a greater demand on the water system for an individual household than a multi-unit complex from people just wanting to water their lawns. Um, so looking at some of the different ways in which we can slice and dice drought. Um, I mentioned that Landsat, the entire collection is available. We have a really great um, Landsat Explorer that allows you to look over the, um, the entire collection, find the scenes that match what you need by playing with uh, cloud masking, um, looking at the different band combinations that would be useful for you. And so if you're interested in doing urban heat island mapping, uh, you can start to quickly find the perfect scene that happens to be in the right time of the year for doing your analysis. And then maybe you wanna extract that into your, your desktop analysis. That's very easy to do, um, or you can, you can build off of that. These also allow for animations and uh, doing swiping and all sorts of things. Um, the, the one that you see at the bottom, um, this is from Sentinel-1, which is synthetic ap aperture radar, which I don't know if anybody has used SAR data. It's kind of difficult to work with sometimes. Um, and so this is looking at doing a um, water body detection. This is the example of Lake Tulare, which is in the Central Valley of California, which had um, during two springs ago, um, massive flooding due to the snowpack. We, we had that you know, historic uh, snowpack in the Sierras, was melting and flooding an area that used to be basically a big lake that has been drained, and it's now one of the uh, largest agricultural centers of the world. Um, but uh, you can see here that Sentinel-2 was, was able to easily identify those water bodies. Um, and we have some other anomalies, um, um, uh, raster functions that can be applied on top of that. And then there's other functions in there in which you can start to do your own thresholding on the fly. So maybe you wanna tweak that one a little bit more to then start to do a summarization and do an area analysis. Um, so Sentinel-1 comes in in real time into Living Atlas. So if you had a pass over Hurricane Debbie area, you would be able to do your flood impact analysis. You know, something that you might be paying a consulting firm thousands of dollars to do, and you could do it almost in real time here if you got that acquisition. But, um, analysis, you, you already saw one example of analysis, but I want to throw one in here for, for the weather geeks. Um, and I know there's probably some weather geeks in the room and on the phone, and we love you. Um, 
But here's an archive of uh, tornadoes, um, and this com comes from the Storm Prediction Center. And, but there's no real spatial or tempor temporal structure to this data. And I want to start to analyze patterns here. So I'm going to run this space-time cube. So I'm going to create a defined temporal and spatial structure to each one of these tornado locations. So I'm going to analyze week, or I'm sorry, annual time steps, and I'm going to grid it um, to about 5,000 square kilometers, each one of those hexagons. And I want to also look at the number of injuries and how that's been changing over time. It's not just the number of tornadoes that matter, it's also the injuries or the fatalities or whatever the attributes of that data set happen to be. And so I can quickly run that. It generates a net CDF file of that, that data cube, that analysis. And I'm just going to open up that data cube and visualize it. So this is both um, visualization and analysis, I guess. And I'm going to look at emerging hotspots. So not just is there a trend in that data, but what is the temporal pattern of that trend? Is it continually increasing? Is it increasing sometimes, but not always? Is it an emerging? Is it diminishing in some areas? Um, you can run this tool on multiple variations. So in this case, I did a 1981 to 2020 time step. You could look at filtering your data into different time components and look at the patterns that you see there, um, you can also then compare the outputs of the of those different time components, and it will do a differencing of that map. So you could start to look at how those trends are really changing over time. And that was also run in real time, right? So the amount, our ability to get these types of insights is really rapidly changing. So now I could go into some of those emerging or uh, persistent hotspots and say, who lives there? So with those uh, demographic tools, I could look at the number of mobile homes that are within those areas. If we're caring or we're worried about um, a weather ready nation, we can be very targeting about our outreach into these areas. Again, really trying to, to drive decisions um, and use geography as a way to, that we can do that. And again, this, that was all based on that service that we update whenever SPC um, updates that tornado archive. So we, we, you could repeat this analysis with hurricanes, right? So we have the, the IB tracks uh, um, um, archive. And you know, some, we'll see, you'll see in the peer reviewed literature, we'll be looking at you know, sub basin level. You know, what are the trends that we see, you know, in a basin or a sub-basin for the Western Atlantic or something like that, right? But it doesn't really break down specifically by geography the trends that you're able to find within those data. So I've run this in well, much larger hexagons for, uh, for hurricanes, and you can see how different areas are lighting up. Um, and it could not just be, you know, look at the intensity or, you know, the, it could be the duration of the dwell time of the hurricane within these different areas. And you can start to really um, unlock some patterns there and not take, you know, months and months of time to do it. Communication. This is becoming more and more important um, to uh, what we do every day. So... Every year, um, the USDA publishes a census of agriculture, uh, much like the census of the United States, which is a decadal or decennial. Um, this is every five years. And it's um, basically a survey that goes out to every farmer um, in the country. And it's, you know, their response is, you know, voluntary, but it's then taken and aggregated. This data, if you go to the USDA, their system for exporting this is one of the worst data systems I've ever seen. Love you, USDA, but it, it, it's really horrible. It's, it's definitely like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s web technology. But we're able to take that to these bulk exports and then build them into functional web services. Um, and so we've characterized about 20 some different commodities, each having 30 or so different attributes of sales and, you know, the number of workforce that are associated with, with that particular commodity, everything from individual crops to livestock and, you know, tractors and whatever it happens to be. Um, so we do that. We publish that every five years. Um, and we make those services available. 
This is a really cool story map that somebody um, in Esri built with who had no subject matter expertise and was not a you know part of this team, but they interviewed some farmers um, to really understand what that data means on the ground and how that data is changing from census to census and really trying to document what the landscape of agriculture is in the United States and how that's changing. Um, and there's just some amazing maps and visuals that kind of go in here that are just looking at the different patterns that you can see in um, in the story of, of agriculture, which supports so many jobs and is worth so many billions of dollars. Uh, but so I, um, the maps that we build in Living Atlas, if I could edit this, this story map right now, I could go in and select those maps that are already contributed to Living Atlas and pull them directly into my story map. So you don't have to even like go outside of that space. It's integrated into this. So as you're thinking about your data, the information products that can be derived from it, building those simple, easy to use maps that we know that not just classrooms, but the president gets a briefing every morning in story maps. His 7 a.m. classified briefing is done in story maps. So it's not just this low level thing. It's those are classified maps that are going into into the story maps um, and informing some use. I've given you some really um, good examples of what you can do with this kind of new pattern of GIS. Um, and I'm here to also work with NCAR in helping you contribute to Living Atlas. We've been discussing that with um, the, the team um, uh, this morning and we'll continue this afternoon. Um, and I'm always a resource uh, available to you at any time if you wanna talk about how you can engage with this. But I just kinda wanted to lay that out in a very simple way. So there's a couple ways in which you can contribute to Living Atlas. Um, one, you can share your content. You build your, your data services, you publish them to ArcGIS Online. And again, happy to work with you on that. Um, and you go through the, the process to get it through. There's also a way in which you can help improve the maps that we already have, our base maps. So you can imagine maybe the base map for the United States or for the world doesn't really detail out the NCAR campus. Maybe it, it's kind of like blurred out. You can actually build out detailed maps of your community and submit that through community maps. Or for example, community maps aggregate stream uh, flow um, gauges from around the world. Individual universities um, are contributing access to those uh, stream gauges, and Esri builds that into a single service, and that's done through the community maps program or road closure networks, things like that, um, where we're trying to provide some value add to individual maps that are available and try to create a, a more informed um, unified map surface. So two different ways in which you can contribute. If you're interested in the first pattern, um, we have a lot of resources that are available for this. Um, you know, when I came to Esri, I knew very little about GIS, and I kind of taught myself a lot of things and then also had a lot of support from, from my team um, and the teams across Esri. But learn.arcgis.com are free resources that have modern GIS workflows that are associated with them. And these are very project-based, so learn how to do a specific uh, task. Um, it's how I learned most of the things that are um, that I do, um, and we're continually publishing uh, new content or new uh, lessons into there. And we'd love to work with NCAR on developing other lessons. We developed some years ago when I first came to to um, to Esri, and was one of my first introductions to uh, to Jen and Olya here. Um, if you're interested in doing um, real time publishing or uh, routinely updating services. So some of those uh, live weather feeds that we have, we have a live feeds methodology that here's a bunch of Python notebooks that are hosted in ArcGIS Online, and you just kind of modify the routines as needed. Um, again, free resources, use them. Um, and those are maintained and updated by our development teams. So we're continually improving this, the code that's in those um, as the technology evolves as well. Um, and so those are fully supported. And then for things like complex, like those Landsat examples, we have some other routines that are available on GitHub 
um, that that um, demonstrate those publishing patterns as well. So um, everything from very simple to very complex. Um, so yeah, there's a couple steps to help building our living atlas. Um, one, create that great content. You have the data. It's really about getting it into those web-based services and optimizing them so they perform really well. And there's definitely tricks to the trade on that. But again, happy to work with you on that. We definitely have some best practices. Um, those are linked off the Living Atlas website. It's not really useful to have a link in a slide here, but I will also share these slides um, and you'll have access to them later. Um, of course, you have to share that content with everyone to get into Living Atlas. Um, and then there's a nomination process. And then through that nomination process, you'll work with a curator. Um, but I just wanted to share that nomination process because it's really quite simple. Um, it, most people think it's really complicated. So you can see I'm logged in here. There's me before I turn gray. And there's a button, contribute. It's going to look at all the content that I have associated with that account. And oh, here is a story map. Um, you'll notice that that nominate button is not blue, and that's because I'm missing some critical metadata. But once that metadata is filled out and it's meeting kind of our automated system check requirements of um, I had a really bad thumbnail and I need delete protection enabled on this thing so it can't just disappear, you know, when somebody else, when you hit delete by accident. Um, but if it, if those were okay, that nominate button would be blue. You could hit that and then it automatically starts the process. And then one of those subject matter experts would uh, contact you and work with you on fixing anything or if there was nothing to fix you'll get a notification when the, once that's accepted into Living Atlas. So it's a relatively painless process. Um, there's, in general, we tend to have a couple of suggestions for, for people to make it more usable by non-subject matter experts, right? This is the GIS community at large. Um, and so uh, we'll work with you to, to really optimize your content for that. But thank you. Um, I want to save a little bit of time for questions. Um, but I'm happy to answer anything that you have or follow up afterwards. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. That was, uh, I always find your talks like inspiring. So now I'm excited to go back and try, try some of these things that I just saw and see if I can do them as well. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, so I will, anyone online, we do have Slido um, that you can ask some questions there and we'll go through those. Um, so if those pop up, anyone in the room have any questions for Dan to start off with? In publishing to your digital atlas, are these data sets, um, like a lot of the data sets we create are, are very local. Uh, we're going to talk about Honduras, a data set for Honduras. How do you... Uh, how, how, what are the nature of some of these? Are they, are they, I mean, no, you know, a limited number of people are interested in those Yeah, we want to make sure that we're curating a collection that is broadly usable to the QIS community. So um, for the United States, um, because we have such a wealth of data, we try to keep things to national data sets, sometimes regional, or let's say, I would say, there's thousands of people interested in wildfires in California. Right, that's kind of an exception to a state level data set, but for so, but for the most part, you'll see very large regions in the United States. Outside of the United States, our distributors, the Esri distributors that are in different countries, actually maintain their kind of view on Living Atlas there. So, um, you know, Mexico has their curators. We don't have a one to one with every country, um, but um, for you know, for example, the the Honduras example. Um, that might be curated by one of the other local countries that are there or our Central America um, region. Um, and so then that's kind of up to them about what the scale and the area of interest is. Um, and it, there's a, a variety of, of scales that we find once you get outside of the United States. It might be city level data because Esri France thinks that France really needs city level data in, in their living atlas. Um, but so it's it's a wide variety. But generally within the U.S., we're, we're looking at global and U.S. things that my teams are, are curating. But then it, it's a patchwork after that. So that there, there's a different. The Living Atlas is, can be unique to a to a region. Yes. Ah, okay. okay. 
and, and the expert, and so we make sure that, you know, so Esri Japan is going to curate Esri or uh, content in Japan because a lot of people are writing the content items and descriptions in Japanese, right? Um, and I certainly cannot uh, review that, that content. So um, yeah, so th that's where having this distributed network is really useful. Thank you. All right, so we have a question online from Matthias. Uh, thank you for a stimulating presentation. I'm curious about the quality control that goes into accepting new data sources. Yeah, so it's something that, um, and this isn't just a once and done thing, and this is also a partnership. So one, um, quality control review starts by us being able to read the descriptions that you put associated with your services and make sure those are very well detailed. If I am not sure about what this thing is or where it comes from, does it have a, a DOI? Does it have citations for how this was generated? Uh, is it peer reviewed? Um, it starts with that, right? And if I think that it's, it's missing those things, one, I'm either gonna just reject it outright because you can sometimes tell or then that becomes part of the conversation. So what exactly is this? And you, could you help define it a little bit better? Um, you know, if it is a model, um, what went into that model? What were the data sets that, that contributed to that model so we can be as transparent as possible? Data quality changes over time, right? So what is really useful now may not be useful in 10 years. And so that's also part of this partnership that um, one, as curators, we touch everything once a year and we're rejecting things that are no longer working or are no longer valid. Um, for example, you're not going to find CMIP4 data in Living Atlas, right? There's still a little bit of CMIP5 and CMIP6 as we're kind of in that transition period, especially with those derived products. Um, but things that are not valid are, are certainly kicked out. Um, but then we also, we're, we also rely on, if you know that this is not no, no longer supported by your team, that you're going to kick that thing out yourself, um, and that that um, curation is is a, is a two way street. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question online from Arno. Uh, what are the access limitations, republishing, license restrictions, and costs for NCAR projects to use Living Atlas data sets in our algorithms, displays, and uh, user end products? So a lot of especially in RAO, a lot of um, our work is developing client-based applications. So using this kind of data, yeah, kind of what are some limitations that we might need to be aware of? Yeah, so one, when you publish something to Living Atlas, you own that data, you own those services. Again, you're just federating the metadata that's associated with it, so our system knows where it is, but you still own it. Um, the licensing and restrictions, that is all defined. And because you own the data, you define the terms of uh, use and the licensing of it. Now, most things that come from Esri are going to be like, okay, are you using it in an Esri platform? Um, that is, in some cases, it uh, Esri master license agreement, and you can read the details on what the terms of use is. This terms of use is required by every item. So maybe it's a Creative Commons, um, CC uh, by 4.0, right? That means you can reuse and redistribute however you want. You just need to cite the uh, source. And citation is also, the credits and attribution are also a requirement that we have to review. Um, so it's going to vary um, depending on the layer. What are the uh, costs and things like that? Um, you can see here that this is in Living Atlas. It was marked as authoritative uh, because it's coming from the National Incident Fire Command. Um, in some cases, you'll see subscription is required. So you could build an application that is using your subscription. It's not costing you anything. You're, you're getting it as part of your subscription to Living Atlas. So the Landsat layers would be a good example of that. Those require a, uh, ArcGIS Online subscription to access. Um, but you can build that Landsat Explorer application on top of it. It didn't ask for a login when you try to open that application. Um, so, and it was built within the, the restrictions of the master license agreement. Um, there's very few examples in which it costs something. And that is, what is the, um, I forget the term of that one. Um, I believe NAPE. No, it's not Abe. Um, 
there are there's probably about 10 data sets in there that it consumes credits to actually use. Um, but out of the 10,000, that's, you know, what percent? Um, I, I would not generally worry about that. Um, it's called premium content. So um, just like you saw the Living Atlas little badge there, it will say premium content. And that um, implies that there is some kind of um, cost associated with it. But just to open the map doesn't cost anything. It's when you're doing kind of more advanced analytics and things like that with, with those layers. Great, thank you. Yeah, and just for um, anyone who doesn't know the GIS program um, here at NCAR, we do have a site license with Esri. So anyone here um, at NCAR, UCAR, um, just send an email and we can get you access to ArcGIS Online where you can start, and ArcGIS Pro if you want to install the desktop application, where you can start exploring some of this. So um, that is available through kind of the GIS program and our licensing agreement with Esri. Yeah, and I, I will say when it's a contributed content, um, there can't be premium, there can't be a uh, subscription that's required, those, those kind of lockdowns. NASA, when they publish content, it's basically just open services available to every, everybody. And then it also, you know, we're doing a lot more to support Open Geospatial Consortium standards and things like that on top of these services. Um, so um, it starts to really start to reduce some of those constraints that the previous question had. Great, and I have a question. I saw one of your apps, um, and so Matthias, who's online, will probably be interested in this as well, was kind of that building um, generation. So kind of a, a workflow that I've gone through that is very time consuming is getting heights on buildings, right? So mm -hmm. finding those building footprints, downloading the LiDAR data. So in that particular type of app, I mean, is that something I zoom into my area of interest and I can run that type of machine learning in order to generate data that I can then download and use in our models? Is that kind of what that idea is? I am going to admit ignorance on that particular app, but uh, but I would assume probably the case. Yeah, that's yeah, that's one that I'll definitely be exploring as well, because that looked really interesting for us for Fast Eddy for some of those applications. Are there any other questions online or in the room? Kevin. Thank you, Dan, for your presentation. Um, you know, I have a question about, uh, let's say, climate data in the Living Atlas. And I think we all know that there are many different institutions out there providing climate data. Almost every PI has their own downscale data set. Um, how do you avoid proliferation? You know, I know the idea of the Living Atlas is authoritative content and, you know, trying to provide users with, um, in, you know, decision ready information. And I guess my, my question is if a lot of people are nominating their own downscale data sets like star, loca, et cetera, um, you know, how do you avoid a kind of too many choices for your users, or or do you just handle it on a case by case basis? I think that's a specific case, and it's something that I, I've struggled with. Um, we've seen you know people that have been trying to nominate their things, but then I get you know I work with USGCRP on a on a daily basis, and uh, you know you hear where different downscale products are validating or not validating, right? Maybe they weren't bias corrected, and you get that kind of insight. I don't know that myself, um, but then. You know, I I feel free to reach out to my my networks of people that know better to inform my curation processes, and so yeah, some agencies have dominated their own downscaled climate projections, and we said no because you know they were they were evaluated through the the NCA five, and they're not they're not valid for the United States, so we're not putting them in. Sometimes tough conversations with some of our clients, but it, ultimately it's not about their ego; it's about the usability for the rest of the community. All right, yep. All right, so there's one more question online. Is it? A comment, great. Oh, Kaspar, nice to see you, Kaspar, hi. Um, just happy comment, thanks for the great presentation and sending examples. Can't wait to discuss more this afternoon. Is every ha if Esri has some outreach development support that can initiate a suite of data curation services for a place such as Honduras, Japan, can Europe, sure, but developing world. So the curation for developing world content. We have a team, um, I don't know their name doesn't really matter, but basically they're, they're working on creating these open data portals for different developing areas of the world. So the first one was Africa Geo Portal. 
Uh, we're working with small island developing states now. Uh, we're actually looking at working directly with the state of Alaska because they have really poor data access due to really uh, low bandwidth that they have getting from data centers in the United States out to Alaska. Different um, regions like that um, who are either data poor or access poor, um, we're, we're working actively on that. And so um, we do that a lot of times in collaboration with GEO um, or other groups in which we're identifying and then supporting initiatives um, with those areas. But uh, for example, um, we're working with Lacey, Latin American Climate Initiative, I think, which is associated with GEO as well to support Central America climate information. Um, but yeah, happy to, to talk about those initiatives that we have. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, it's time. Thank you, everyone who is here in person and those online. If we can thank Dan one more time. And thank you.